Coming up, he's a Cherokee artist, but his work may surprise you. If you're a native person and you're an artist, everyone says, well, you need to do this type of art. They give me pictures of like, you know, Indian in a headdress on a horse, you know, and that wasn't my experience. Artist Roy Boney Jr. shares the Cherokee experiences that inspire his work, hoping to bring recognition to parts of the Cherokee culture still unfamiliar to a lot of people. Also in this episode, the legendary Cherokee Ned Christie. Recognized by some as the ultimate Indian outlaw, he's often described as a fierce killer who refused to die. But that's not how many Cherokees see him. What I know about Ned Christie is that he was a statesman. He was well respected amongst the Cherokee people, primarily because he spoke and wanted Cherokee sovereignty. The true story of Ned Christie, a man many Cherokees know not as an outlaw, but as a patriot. And later, come along with me, your host, as genealogists trace my Cherokee heritage. And were imprisoned for two weeks in jail. Unveiling secrets from my ancestors' past and sad reminders of the struggles they endured when forced onto the Trail of Tears. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. OCO and welcome to the Cherokee Nation. We're so proud to share our stories with you. Wado. OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, in Tahlequah, the heart of the Cherokee Nation. This show is the first of its kind. We'll take you on a journey through Cherokee country and bring you the personal stories of the people who shape our nation. I grew up here in Oklahoma and being Cherokee has always been very important to me. But the Cherokee Nation has such a rich and complex history, I really feel like my journey is just beginning. So to learn more about my Cherokee heritage, I enlisted the help of Cherokee Nation genealogists. For me, this is where it all started, on my great-grandparents' farm. It's where my roots began to grow and where they were planted by my mother and the two generations before her. It's the land they were allotted 115 years ago under the Dawes Act, which cleared the way for Oklahoma statehood, and it's still a place we call home. For years, this clock hung on the farmhouse wall. It survived the Trail of Tears and was a constant reminder of the struggle our ancestors endured. Many of our stories have been passed down through the generations, but as I found out, there's a lot more to discover. Genealogists at the Cherokee Heritage Center researched my ancestry, and while both of my great-grandparents were Cherokee, they focused their search on my great-grandmother, Thelma Muskrat Lee, my beloved granny. My family kept pretty good records, I think. Right. Yeah, they did. And so what were you able to find? We were able to locate the family's information here in the Cherokee Nation and then uh, connect them back to information prior to the uh, forced removal. All right, let's go check it out. Definitely. I was blown away by what they found, a well-documented history of my ancestors' lives. This is Jean Norris, our senior genealogist. Hi, nice to meet you, Jennifer. Nice to meet you. You too, you too. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this sure. for me. What they found was much more than just census records. I read an actual transcription of my great-great-grandfather's testimony to the Dawes Commission, where he had to provide evidence he and his children, my granny, were Cherokee. They uncovered telling details about my fifth great-grandfather, Richard Fields, leader of the Texas Cherokees, and his correspondence with the Spanish and Texas governments trying to secure more land. Fields was a man of considerable intelligence, and although he spoke the English language fluently, he was not able to sign his name. It's one thing to hear stories about my great-grandparents, but to actually see details of their lives in black and white, I felt a stronger connection to them than ever before. Like these lists of all of the possessions their families were forced to leave behind when they were pushed from their homes in North Carolina and in Tennessee. Horses and corn cribs, peach trees, and of course, their homes. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned a clock mm -hmm. that came over the trail. So that some of the things they got to take, mm -hmm. they could grab whatever they could. So that was apparently a very important thing mm -hmm. to uh, Jackson's wife. They just grabbed stuff. 
you know, and that's all they could take with them. So they were put into wagons. My fourth great grandfather and full blood Cherokee, Jacob Muskrat, was just five years old when he was driven onto the trail. There are actually records showing which detachment he and his family were part of. The Sudawegi Detachment, which traveled 2,000 miles on the frigid northern route. Sadly, many of their Cherokee neighbors died along the way, but my family survived. I also found out Jacob's father, Jackson Muskrat, had already survived another tragedy. He and three other Cherokees were wrongfully accused of killing a white man back in Georgia. And were imprisoned for two weeks in jail and acquitted without a trial. And it was afterwards ascertained that the murder was by a white man citizen. So they were imprisoned in the East. Wrongly. Wrongly and were looking for uh, compensation for that. All of this new information was a lot to absorb. I feel really blessed that um, we have such incredible records. I mean, granted, um, the reason that they're keeping the records right. is pretty sad. Um, right. But I still, at the same time, feel really blessed to be able to know all of this. For me, this new information somehow helps to humanize the people I never knew, and I couldn't wait to share it with my family. My mother, Janet, is our family's historian. She spent a lot of time on Monkey Island with my great-grandmother, Thelma, who passed on as many stories and details as she could. Stories about my great-great-aunt Ruth, who was honored by the Smithsonian for her work fighting for the civil rights of all Native Americans. This is the dress that Ruth wore? Right, uh-huh. It's a doe-skin dress. She broke ground for a Cherokee woman from Cowskin Prairie. She did a lot. And stories about Grandfather Muskrat hunting with this bow also passed down through the generations. Granny remembers seeing him use it. In fact, she remembers her dad um, had a little blow dart gun that he used, too. But my mom had never seen these lists detailing the productive farms our ancestors were forced to abandon. One meat house, four mm -hmm. stables. Oh my goodness. One acre horse lot, two corn cribs. With everything that they had to leave behind, I've, I mean, I just wonder why they decided to bring that clock. I don't know how it made it here. I don't know, I just know it's the family treasure. It's very important that uh, your girls know all this. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you insight into why you are who you are and why you do things and why you think things. Mm -hmm. One thing we both wanted to know, what's left of the old homestead where the muskrats first settled in Indian territory? Those pine trees tell you for sure that's where it was. Grandfather Muskrat planted them. And there were pine trees up both sides of this old drive. And the house sat right just on the other side of the pine trees. Where the cows are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just wish that um, the, the land could talk. You wish those trees could talk. While much of our history is gone, I'm grateful today to know so much about my Cherokee roots and the lives of the people I come from. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to pass our heritage along to my children who one day will ask, who am I? If you'd like our genealogist to research your Cherokee ancestry, go to oco.tv and click on the Links Mentioned tab. The Cherokee Nation is set to expand the campus here at the W.W. Hastings Hospital in Tahlequah, and a joint venture with Indian Health Services could provide up to $30 million a year for staffing and services. The expansion of medical facilities at Hastings will add exam rooms, expand services, and shorten wait times. Hastings was built more than 30 years ago and designed to service 65,000 patient visits per year. Last year, the hospital oversaw about 400,000 patient visits. 37 tribes applied for the joint venture, and the Cherokee Nation was among the top three selected. This is probably the greatest day in the Cherokee Nation modern times, uh, where we have been able to announce a joint venture at W.W. Hastings Hospital that uh, will truly change lives, not only for this generation, but for generations to come. The agreement with IHS will last for at least 20 years and possibly many more decades to come. The joint venture is in addition to a $100 million health care expansion the nation is already undergoing, funded entirely by casino profits. Four new health centers are set to open this spring. We'll have more on that a little later. 
Cherokee artists have always played a major role in our tribe's culture. Artist Roy Boney Jr. represents a new generation of Cherokee artists. While his artwork may be inspired by his Cherokee heritage, it's probably not what you'd expect, and that's exactly the way he likes it. The word for art in Cherokee is tathilosta. The word itself is describing measuring. So it's talking, if you're drawing, you're like making lots of tiny little measurements. So it it's, talks about the idea of how uh, planned and accurate art is, the process of making art. You know, people have never seen some of, some of this type of stuff, so they would ask me, you know, like, are, are you really doing native art? And I always say, yes, I am, because I'm Cherokee and I'm making art, so it, it's Cherokee art. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Roy Boney Jr. I grew up in the community of Iron Post, which is just south of Locust Grove, a very small Cherokee community there. I was raised in a, a, a Cherokee-speaking family. I was always drawing pictures, that was something I've always done, you know, and uh, I didn't think anything about it. If you're a native person and you're an artist, everyone says, well, you need to do this type of art. They give me pictures of like, you know, Indian in the headdress on a horse, you know, and that wasn't my experience. Cherokees, we have our own distinct culture. I said my interest in the digital arts is kind of what got me away from that. Growing up with, you know, Cherokee as part of my background with the language, I wanted content that was in Cherokee, but it really wasn't out there. Yeah, a lot of my pieces uh, start with uh, like a word or a phrase in Cherokee and I kind of work from there. The language does inform a lot of the pieces. I like to incorporate the, uh, you know, some of the more traditional characters in Cherokee, you know, stories like the trickster and, you know, the deer people, the, the turtles and the, like the raccoon and different things. I like the trickster stories because they, uh, one, they're entertaining, you know, the trickster's always getting into trouble and causing some mischief and a lot of times they're humorous, and but in the end, they impart a lesson to you. Uh, you know, people that hear the stories or read them or whatever, uh, they always end up learning something from that story. And a lot of times it deals with uh, basically how to behave as a Cherokee, you know, like well, things that you're supposed to do, or things, actually it's things you're not supposed to do as a Cherokee, you know, because the trickster's always doing something wrong or getting into trouble. I do what I can to help promote the language and culture as much as I can. Exploring the use of Cherokee and using the language in a more popular culture type of format like you know, animations and videos and comics and design. I think it, it shows that as a people that we're relevant because a lot of people tend to dismiss you know, tribes as like either not even around anymore or just stuck in the past. One of my goals as an artist is to incorporate the imagery and the symbols of Cherokee things into my art so people can see it and kind of start to recognize some of these elements that they may not be familiar with. All the, the, the really good art, I think, you know, of any culture, there's always an element of commentary to it and it expresses the, uh, the time, place, and the people in which it was created. The main statement that I'm trying to in part is uh, that we are a distinct people, that we have our own culture, our own symbols, our own icons. As a Cherokee artist especially, that's, that's my goal, is to help you know, put the, the Cherokee point of view out there. For a closer look at Roy's art, go to our website, oco.tv, and click on the Links Mentioned tab. One hundred new jobs are coming to Sequoia County. The final beam has been placed atop Cherokee Casino Roland, which is undergoing a major expansion. A hotel, convention space, and more dining and entertainment options are being added to the facility. The casino expansion will add millions of dollars to the local economy. Anytime there's economic development, you know, in the region, it benefits everyone. Cherokee Casino Roland is located on Interstate 40, just west of the Oklahoma-Arkansas state line.
In the 1880s, a 16-year-old Cherokee named Ed Hicks watched the demonstration of something called a telephone at an exhibit in St. Louis. Hicks made it his mission to bring the device to the people of the Cherokee Nation. First, he needed to convince skeptical Cherokee officials who were worried about railroads coming into the nation. So Hicks set up a telephone demonstration in Tahlequah where two Cherokees talked to one another in the Cherokee language. The counselors approved the lines since the device could, quote, talk Cherokee. And so Hicks and two workers used wagons and a team of mules to string copper telephone line from Tahlequah to Fort Gibson and into the Creek Nation in Muskogee. The line started at the Stapler store in Tahlequah and reached Fort Gibson on August 6, 1886, and the first call was made. One man said, hello, who is this? The other answered, this is the devil and I'm coming after you. It was the first long distance phone call on the first phone line in what is now the state of Oklahoma. And it was right here in Cherokee territory. Cherokees living in and around Adair County will soon have a larger, more efficient health care center to serve their needs. Thanks to a $9 million expansion funded by casino profits, the Wilma P. Mankiller Health Center will double in size, expedite patient wait times, and provide new state-of-the-art equipment. With all the expansions and stuff that's going to be better, they're not going to have to travel as far. Um, we're not going to have to um, wait to get in to see a provider. Um, and also it's going to provide more jobs. More than 134,000 patients visited the health center last year, which is expected to open this spring. The Stillwell Health Center is actually one of four under construction right now. Cherokee Nation businesses provided $100 million of casino money to pay for brand new health care facilities in Oshaleta and Jay, plus expansions in Stillwell, Salisaw, and Tahlequah. All four new or expanded health centers will open this year. The Cherokee Nation needs to hire more health care workers at those facilities. It's increased its budget by $4.3 million. If you'd like to apply for one of those jobs, go to OCO.TV and look in links mentioned. Chalagi iniwoni hi. Let's talk Cherokee. First phrase in English. Where are you going? Hoslahegan. In English. I am going home. The ganagi si. I am going home. The ganagi si. Where are you going? I am going to work. I am going to work. A lot more Oklahomans are driving around with Cherokee tags now that the nation has opened two new tag offices, one here in Tahlequah and one in the Tulsa area. The Cherokee Nation opened its first ever Tulsa area tag office in December. Since expanding car tag sales to Cherokee statewide last year, an additional 10,000 license plates have been sold. Adding a Tulsa area tag office helps better meet the needs of those wanting a Cherokee tag. I actually was on my parents' insurance no, you know, now before, um, so now I'm going to have a title in my own name and be able to have my own Cherokee tag and be proud to be driving around as a member of the Cherokee Nation and show that to everyone. The nation also opened a new tag office in Tahlequah with more windows, more seating, and additional parking. Since expanding the car tag sales statewide, car tag revenues are up more than $2 million over last year, and that means more money for area schools, law enforcement, and roads and bridges. The Tulsa tag office is located at Interstate 44 and 161st East Avenue, and the Tahlequah tag office is located at 120 East Valentine Road. To be eligible for a Cherokee car tag, you must be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and live within the state of Oklahoma. This copy of the Lord's Prayer in the Cherokee language has a new home at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. The late Woodrow Roach of Tahlequah fought for the U.S. Army in World War II and believed this prayer was his good luck charm. Roach's family donated the prayer to the museum as a way to honor his sacrifice. 
Let's go back to 1887, when northeastern Oklahoma was Indian territory. The railroads were moving in, and so were a lot of outlaws. For many people, Ned Christie is the ultimate Indian outlaw. He was called an outlaw, but many Cherokees disagree. Well, a lot of people, when they think of Ned Christie, they think of him as an outlaw. A lot of the literature that you read, a lot of the exhibits that you see, portray Ned as an outlaw who killed a deputy U.S. Marshal. To the Cherokees, though, he is a patriot. In the hills of Jolly, there lived a man called Christie. He was well respected amongst the Cherokee people. Be primarily because he spoke and wanted Cherokee sovereignty. He did not want uh, encroachment. He did not want any type of uh, dealings with the white people coming inside and basically taking what we had. As Ned had grown up in uh, Adair County. Uh, his dad had fought in the Civil War, uh, Watt, Watt Christie. And Watt Christie was a known blacksmith. And so Ned growing up, uh, we teach her skills to her children. Uh, he learned how to be a blacksmith too. From what I understand is that the guns that he was given from the Civil War that his dad had fought with uh, were powder guns. Uh, Ned had converted them down to uh, where it's percussion, where he didn't have to use the powder, and it made him quicker and faster to reload. And he was a young man when he was doing this. I think Ned had this feeling toward the United States and toward people who were non-Cherokee, particularly white people, that they had no right in his nation, and especially if they were going to influence it in some way. It really all begins in 1887. The Cherokee Female Seminary had burned on Easter Sunday, and there had been a council meeting that had been called here in Tahlequah. And they're discussing funds and what to do with the rebuilding of the school. He's up around the north part of Tahlequah. Uh, he's going to ride back the next day. Uh, he wants to go and get something to drink before he goes home. So he ventured to a part of town that had a, a, a speakeasy type place. Goes to visit some people up north, and there's a, man, a woman up there who sells him some whiskey. He goes, drinks that, he ends up passing out. He woke up the next morning, ventured into town where he heard he was accused of killing a marshal by the name of Dan Maples. Initially there were about five people who had been accused of being in the vicinity where Dan Maples had been shot and killed. Ned was the only one that they were never able to apprehend, therefore he became the main uh, suspect. The people there tell him, Ned, they're going to be coming here looking for you. Uh, you need to take off and run. And he's, he was wanting to explain his uh, position that he wasn't there and that he was innocent of these charges. He doesn't leave, like, leave the state and run. Uh, he basically goes back home. And he sends letters, even to Hanging Judge Parker, uh, saying that uh, I did not commit this crime. Please give me some time to prove my innocence. Marshals would come, bounty hunters, and he realized then that this was a fight that wasn't going to be anything simple for him or his family. He had a, a lot of people protecting him. Uh, there was a, a mountain that had been a fort, I guess that you would say, a lookout and they would warn Ned when there were marshals or other people in the vicinity of, of his home. I think the sense of community was extremely tight. That extended to everybody that lived here. And so they rallied around him to make sure that he was okay. It's a huge sort of fortified structure. It was designed so that he could look outside the window and see if anybody was coming so he could shoot and could keep himself protected. Family lived there and as many times as the marshals tried to go and get him, he kept himself free from them, five years. They knew where he was, five years, and they couldn't go and get him. There was a new marshal that came over at Fort Smith, and his name was Marshal Jacob Yose. And Yose thought this had gone on long enough, so he wanted Ned apprehended. And the reward was, was fairly large. I believe it was almost $1,000 at that point. They say it was about a posse of about 32 men that came. They'll also bring a cannon with them, uh, which shoots projectiles shaped like bullets. From what I understand, it's about 36 shots they sent this cannon shooting at this house and they couldn't bring it down. And so much so that the more powder they put in there eventually they end up blowing up part of the cannon. But they also bring with them a lot of dynamite. That they use almost like, like a trailer to take the cannon, take the cannon off of it and the axle, hid behind it and pushed it towards the house because they had TNT, they had dynamite. And while Ned was trying to keep them off and shooting at them, they tossed the dynamite there and brought the structure down. Ned, knowing he's ran out of ammunition, goes out the front door of the cabin and he has his rifle up as if he's going to shoot, but it's empty of any bullets. And of course they shoot him. And then they all unloaded and they killed him. Yeah, he was an innocent Cherokee man. They put him on display, public display. Propped him up on the front porch of the, the courthouse 
and let all of the crowd see him. So people could come up there and they would stand there, take their shots with him, they'd kill Ned Christie. This is the federal government saying this is what happens to you if you decide to go up against us. It's sad to see that as someone's legacy when in the Cherokee Nation, we revere him as this wonderful patriot, somebody who really stood up for our rights as a nation. And Ned was accused of everything, everything, every crime that showed up in those five years that he was running from the people. He was accused of everything, about 11, 12, 15 murders from what I understand. And uh, he didn't do any of them, not a single one. And so around 1918, a man, Humphreys, came forward. He was a, a Cherokee freedman. He states that uh, he saw the murder of Deputy U.S. Marshal Dan Maples and that it had been Bub Trainer who, who had done the shooting. I really don't think Ned was uh, fully exonerated. Why do I say that? People even call, still today call him an outlaw. But there was no one there to see, so they just killed Ned Christie. If I had three words to describe Ned Christie, a patriotic Cherokee warrior. Our Geronimo, our sitting bull. I believe he set out to prove to his people that you don't have to sit down. You don't have to be in the background. We're still fighting for our sovereignty and our rights today. And so Ned Christie was a voice and a symbol for us then and now. He was fighting for his people. And that's us, the Cherokee people, which I think it's why his legacy, his story still lives on. Here at the Cherokee National Prison Museum, there's an outlaw exhibit which includes the Ned Christie story. For museum information, visit oco.tv. Join us next time. It's part of the game we play, um, living life on the edge. We go behind the scenes with professional bull rider and Cherokee citizen Ryan Dirt Eater. You know, if your style's good and you're sitting in the middle of it and everything's going right, you'll get a higher score. The grit and the glory that keep this Cherokee County native coming back for more. Watch his story and much more next time on OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People. That's our show. Thank you for watching. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. So until next time, what else?